because Solomon didn't have an unconditional covenant like David did. Solomon's uh, covenant with God was conditional. So notice what it says in verse 16. Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David my father that which thou hast promised him. He ain't saying what you promised me. Because God didn't promise it to Solomon. He promised it to David. Saying, there shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit upon the throne of Israel, yet so that they, thy children take heed to their walk, their way to walk in my law as thou hast walked before me. In that verse? Where's the condition in that verse? You tell me. Where's the condition in that verse? That's why I see if you're not paying attention, you know, went right by you, so like let balloon over the Grand Canyon. You know. Where's the condition in that verse? Let's read it again. Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that which thou hast promised him saying, There shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit upon the throne of Israel. Yet so... Uh-oh, there it was. There's the condition. Yet so, meaning if only that thy children take heed to their way to walk in thy, my law as thou hast walked before me. There's the condition. Now then, O Lord God of Israel, let thy word be verified. And Solomon's really doing good, so he's sort of like Martin Luther. He started out all right. He started out believing right, doing right, standing on the Bible. But he ends up going apostate. He ends up adopting all kinds of baloney of the pagan religions around him. It's the same condition as 2 Samuel 7.14. Let's go there. Second Samuel seven fourteen. I'll start at thirteen. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words, according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. See, now the question is, how did Solomon die? Did he die true to the faith or had he apostatized and built chapels for his queens and his girls and concubines and the false gods? He apostatized, boys and girls. He did not end quite well. That's why he's associated with 666. Let's go back and take a little bit. Uh, so what we're dealing with here in 2 Chronicles 6 God's, God's going to be faithful. And uh, his faithfulness was conditional to Solomon, but unconditional to David, as the land was to Abraham in Genesis 15. Therefore, the throne must and will yet be fulfilled by David's son and David's Lord. Amen. But as far as Solomon, staying true to the faith, he did not. <laughs> yeah. He did not. <coughs> See, this is what's so awesome about the Lord, and when you know the Lord, and read what the book says, um,
poor Calvinist, you got to pity him. You know, they just think God just knows the future and He makes everything fit the future. And you're damned, some are damned to hell, some are damned to heaven. But no, no, no. God made man with a free will, and God knows all the futures that would be if man chose to do something totally different. Every man chose to do something totally different. God knows all the futures. Amen. He said in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven will forgive their sin heal their land. Notice here the free will of man. God knows what will and will not, could and could not happen. Yet it is all conditioned upon men's choices. A bigger God than Calvinists give him credit for to be. Amen. Amen. So, what an awesome sight it had to be to be there on that Feast of Dedication when Solomon prayed and the fire came down and consumed the sacrifices. Amen. And uh, all the Jews always celebrated that, and even Jesus Christ celebrated that. But now these cheap Jews in America, for sure, and probably most of them around the world, they changed all that to Happy Hanukkah. And they've lost sight of the Feast of Dedication, I would love to find out how many of the uh, Orthodox Jews, and who among them still teach the truth, <coughs> just practice uh, Feast of Dedication, instead of getting sidetracked with that uh, Happy Hanukkah baloney, you know? It's just got to be something cheap, you know, they did just for the kids' sake, counteract the Christians' Christmas baloney in mm -hmm. the Catholic Church. That all of Christendom celebrates all the Christendom lands, you know, of what they consider mm -hmm. the countries of Christianity. Yeah, really, it would, would have been almost like Elijah when Elijah prayed, and you know, fire came down and licked up all the water and exactly. consumed it. To see something like that, it would exactly. be amazing. Yeah, that's why again, uh, because yeah, because of Elijah, because of Solomon. Again, it's that idea that since the scriptures can't be broken, then what's the odds? Because the Bible doesn't come right out and say, does it? It doesn't come right out and say in Genesis that when Abel offered a sacrifice, that God answered from, from heaven with fire. But since he did in Elijah's day, and since he did in Solomon's day, well, since the scriptures can't be broken, there's a pretty good chance that's what happened with Abel, too. When Abel, Abel, brought the blood of a lamb like his daddy had taught him and it was that time of year and he's offering the blood of a lamb and his brother Cain's offering his fruit stand religion. His was accepted. Cain's wasn't. Hmm. And then Cain's jealous of him because he's got the don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> and his brother's saying, what are you so happy about? You know, so we're mad because <laughs> brother's happy, his sacrifice was accepted. But Cain's is not, and Cain isn't going to get accepted either. In fact, God's got to say, why are you mad? Sin lies at the door. What's wrong with you, boy? Remember that thing? Mm -hmm. Genesis 4, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived her Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. That's where this expression comes from. We're going to raise Cain as soon as we get able. Amen. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. <coughs> now this is where there's a change. Have you ever noticed this change in your Bible? Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created. Genesis 2, verse 4, the Lord God. Verse 5, the Lord God. Verse 7, the Lord God. Did you see that? Verse, chapter 3 now, the Lord. Chapter 4, Cain brought the fruit of the ground and the offering unto the Lord. Why is that?
Because now, God is now personally known by covenant. It's more than a God-man relationship. In the beginning, God created. It's a father-son by covenant. So now we can call him the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Now again, how would God have respect unto Abel's offering? Again, we believe by fire. Because it's consistent with all these other verses, what God will do later. Because something happened that the Lord showed, I like what you're doing, Abel. I accept that, Abel. And Cain's over there. Well, how come you won't accept mine? You know, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now it's very important you get this straight, because some people get this all screwed up. Somehow they think, well, see, uh, sinners are supposed to serve us saints that ruling over him and so forth. <coughs> Is that more proof that Cain must have been a black man? <laughs> the white man's going to rule over the black man? <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> No, not at all. And Cain talked with Abel's brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel's brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is, thy, Abel, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, yes, quite frankly, you are. Never forget that. It's one of the old lies of the devil. Well, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Now, if that's true of Cain and Abel, hmm. what's happening with all these aborted babies in America? You don't think God hears all that bloodshed? All those babies thrown in a dumpster. All that blood going down the drains and into the sewers. That's right. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Now notice this was a curse put on him, not a seed. Like, again, the sure. few people want to teach. Right. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Well, he had that right. He didn't say me or my children or my succeeding generations. No. Behold, thou hast driven me out of this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond. He got that right. It wasn't his children. Mm -hmm. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. No, there still was no curse put on Cain if somebody killed him. Cain, uh, if somebody killed Cain, the curse was he would get to live and nobody would get to kill him. And God put the, the curse on anybody that would try to kill Cain. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any man, or lest uh, any finding him should kill him. Notice it was a curse put on him, not his people. Again. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod. He was going to sleep at the wheel on the east of, east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, so there he goes. He must have got him a monkey for a wife. That must be Lucy or somebody. And she conceived and bears. No, 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 no. Get out of here. Are you crazy? Notice how when the Bible says in Genesis chapter 5, it says Adam had sons and daughters, but yet we don't know a single daughter's name. And the truth is, about this time, Adam and Eve had about, with their kids and extended grandkids, and 
I mean, the, the tribe was growing, man. Uh, so easily he could have a sister, have a sister, or have a cousin even. Because there's a good handful. Uh, it don't take them long. I guess we go over and look at the chart. See of those that are being born and so forth. It's a very interesting study. But again, we're just pointing out how this business of the God ex had respect to Abel's offer. Because he brought the firstlings of his flock. In other words, the very best of his flock. He didn't take, oh, let's take that old broken leg one, put that up there, give that to God, get that one that's blind, we don't need that one. No, no, he gave God his best. <coughs> man, I'd like to keep this one, man. This could really produce some good sheep, man. No, no, he offered that up. The best was offered. Firstlings of his flock. And the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect. Amen. So she wasn't kidding when she said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Amen. Of the two, Abel showed himself more of a man than Cain, that's for sure. In the process of time, In other words, it was kind of, Adam had trained his boys that at a certain point they were to make an offering to God. We don't know when it was. We don't know where it was. But obviously there was some kind of a teaching that had gone on there that mm -hmm. they knew it was that time of year. Obviously there must have been some kind of harvest. Surely he wouldn't just be offering seeds up there in the spring or something. He's, it's obviously some type around the harvest time. Probably around, you know... Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of uh, Trumpets, Feast of Atonement, some, somewhere probably right in there. Of course, Jude 11 speaks of it being his own way. Uh, and Abel here, it clearly says it was his first fruits. Of course, it tells us in Hebrews 11, amen, by faith, he, he brought a more excellent sacrifice. And of course, how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So obviously, there had been some teaching going on there. Adam had taught his boys some, mm -hmm. some kind of whatever Bible they had, whatever <coughs> revelation God had given them. They were applying it so that it was that time of the year when they were supposed to make and give a sacrifice to the Lord. And of course, again, his uh, Abel's was accepted, Cain's was rejected. Let's see if we can find any more Bible for this idea of God is lis listening and responding with fire. How about Leviticus? Chapter 9 and verse 24. Leviticus 9, 24. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. Now that's called worship. You see that? What the? Huh? Did you see that? Something's going on, man. Something's going on, and guess what? Guess when this happened? When did this happen? Was it on Sabbath day? Oh, wait, no, no, Sabbath day, seventh day. Leviticus 9.1, and it came to pass on the eighth day. Oh, no. That means it was Sunday. Amen. For all the clowns that try to think the Old Testament teaches us that ever since the creation, God expects us to worship the Lord on the seventh day. Well, what about this clown? When did the fire pop out? 
when Pastor Moses and Aaron was taking care of business for the Lord. They came out and blessed the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto the people. There came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. <laughs> See, God likes God leaves his shouting in the meeting. Amen? Amen. Hey! Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right, how about another one? How about Judges 621? Judges 621. There's a lot of preaching in this book. Isn't it? 621. 20 says, And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. What are we reading about? Gideon. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we saw them. First barbecue. Amen. Boom. Amen. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. How about, okay, uh, 1 Kings 18.38. Then the fire fell. Here we go. Here's old Elijah. Amen. 1 Kings 18. Here's the contest with the prophets of Baal. Oh, Baal Harris, oh, Baal Harris, oh, Baal Harris. I mean, man, they're trying their best, man. They're, they got their vespers going and they're doing their best. They're tweedling their beach, you know, and stabbing themselves, cutting themselves with whips and making blood flow, trying to get their God to listen. And uh, the old preacher starts making fun of you know, well, maybe he's out in the outhouse or somewhere. Maybe you got to get a little louder or something. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Man. And when God's fire falls, it still does a lot of licking, amen? Mm -hmm. You're in for a licking, they said. The chastening fire of the Lord. How about First Chronicles? First Chronicles 21, 26. David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord. And he answered him with fire, with heaven, from heaven with fire by fire upon the altar of the burnt offering. See, these guys thought nothing that God would just send the fire down. They didn't have to worry about flicking their bick underneath there or doing nothing. So interesting, because verse 22 tells us. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord, and thou shalt grant it me for the full price that the plague may be stayed from the people. And yet this very same place, the place, is exactly the same place that Solomon's going to pray, and God's going to send fire down a second time, and it's going to consume the sacrifices on the offering then too. Exact same place. But David's buying it here. <laughs> he did something. All sacrifices accepted by God were consumed by fire from heaven, not kindled on earth. Religion. Oh, surely God, I'm going to genuflect and I'm going to do deep, deep ends like candles. I'm going to baptize myself. I'm going to flagellate myself. Surely I'm going to merit heaven. No, 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 no. It's do or done, amen. Two kinds of religion, do or done. Mine's done, man. Jesus did it all for me. Nothing I can do. I've heard from heaven. Amen. God sent the fire down. God sent the fire down and consumed his son <laughs> instead of me. Praise the Lord. Now I've got the joy. <coughs> <to it. laughs> We're still singing that song. Of course, we've already read 2 Chronicles 7 1. Let's go to. Uh, or have we? Have we read 2 Chronicles 7 1? Yeah. Let's go to Psalm 1. Praying, the fire came down. Yeah, we did that. Now let's go to uh, Psalms. 
20 and verse 3. Psalms 20 and verse 3, and then we'll be done in just a second. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice, say love. Amen. A Psalm of David. sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice. Selah. There it is. Think about it. Grant thee according to thine own heart to fulfill all thy counsel. O Lord, hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. We will rejoice in thy salvation and in the name of our God we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. So the atonement, the accepted sacrifice is the only ground on which prayer can be answered. Amen. So saying your prayers is not going to do anything like praying your prayers will. And of course Hebrews 11 and verse 4, as we already mentioned, How did Abel give that sacrifice? Isn't that amazing? You could read Genesis all day and you wouldn't get the clue. Finally, when you read almost the Bible all the way through to Hebrews 11, verse 4, then finally God gives you the little piece of the puzzle. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. See, he went away from that knowing, man, God's accepted me. I'm going to heaven. I can't go to hell. <laughs> Was righteous. God assured him by consuming that sacrifice. Guess what? When Jesus was God's sacrifice, when Jesus went to hell for you, that's why it's a once for all salvation. That's how you know you're righteous. This is nothing you did. It's all Him. It's His sacrifice. It's God providing Himself the Lamb, like He said in Genesis 22. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice of Cain, by which he obtained witness he was God testifying of his gifts. And by it he, being dead, yet speaketh. Very interesting. You could almost say, that Abel illustrates faith's worship. In verse 5, Enoch, in Enoch we see faith's walk. Verse 7, Noah is an example of faith's witness, because he's an open-air preacher, 2 Peter 2, 5. illustrates faith's worship. Enoch illustrates faith's walk. Noah illustrates faith's witness. 